All right, one other point that I want to get to. And I really don't know what I'm going to say because I haven't thought about it much. But I wrote something yesterday about the first post-Robert Sala press conference conducted by Aaron Rodgers. And I stand by everything I wrote. I listened to the entire press conference. And I understand that some of the Jets reporters are a little upset that I told the truth. Because that's the thing. You can rant and rave about me. You can try to dismiss me as an aggregator. Real ones know otherwise. You can say that I'm up on my high horse, whatever whatever the stuff was. You, you can be somebody who pretends to be independent but is actually in the pocket of the team because they're feeding you everything and you're behaving not just like external PR but basically internal PR. I don't care about any of that. I don't care. I care about seeing opportunities to get to the truth taken advantage of. And I understand that it's a unique kind of ecosystem when you're part of a group of reporters that cover a team and there's 10, 15, 20 in the room. It depends upon the size of the market, depends upon the size of the team. But when they're all in there to ask questions, I understand it can be awkward, I can, I, especially when you're dealing with the delicate genius. They had a chance to ask him very simple, simple questions aimed at getting to what he knew, when he knew it, and what he thinks about the firing of Robert Sala. And it didn't happen. It just didn't happen. I saw one of them that was complaining that, oh, all those questions are answered in the... Bullshit. They're not. I listened to the whole thing. I didn't write it because I found the content of the Aaron Rodgers press conference fully satisfying, the questions all appropriate, and the answers revealing. I was frustrated. And to those who would say, well, you should show up. Hey, you don't understand how it works. I got to be here every day. I cover the whole league. I'm not part of a beat. I don't pop into press conferences on a Tuesday up in Pittsburgh or a Wednesday in Minnesota. I'm going to jump on a plane and fly to New York and go to the Aaron Rodgers press conference. I didn't even know what day of the week it would be. It's usually Wednesday. This week it's Thursday because they play on Monday. What am I going to do? What am I going to do? Finish the show and take a private jet to Florham Park? So... That's why we have beat writers. So the rest of us who cover the sport, who analyze the things that are said, so we get the information. The beat writers are the ones who are there at the tip of the spear to ask the questions. So, and look, don't just take my word for it. Here's the key exchange from the Aaron Rodgers press conference where not one, not two, but three questions were asked before Aaron Rodgers had a chance to answer. And obviously, he answered the third one, which was far more open-ended and far less pointed than the other two. Have a listen. We talked about, you know, one of the reasons you came here was Robert. For, for them to make a change so quickly at two and three, did you think that that was too early? Did you, did you think, you know, he deserved more time? Or just what's your general reaction to the timing of it and all that? I mean, like I said yesterday, I've seen a lot in 20 years in the league. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a it's a beautiful profession. It's a really tough business. So, these decisions are part of it. It was, you know, obviously the direction that Woody wanted to go. Um, and all we can do now is to get behind brick and move forward. Now, my criticism was very simple, and I really do think I struck a nerve. And I do think the Jets beat reporters doth protest too much. They know I'm right. And I'm not mad at any of them. I understand it's a natural human reaction. Somebody's criticizing the way you do your job. Somebody is coming at you. We got to band together. And and but did any of them say I was wrong other than to suggest that all those questions and answers were addressed and they weren't? I suggested a variety of questions that could have been asked and they weren't. And the one question, seven words, very simple. Did Robert Sala deserve to get fired? Yeah, seven words. Now, usually you don't want to ask yes or no questions. But some you do want to ask. That's as simple as it gets because we're trying to figure out whether or not Aaron Rodgers' fingerprints are on this. We heard the whole thing on Wednesday about how he's offended. He's, he, he resents the suggestion that he had anything to do with it. Okay, fine. You've opened the door, Aaron. 
Let's send in the detectives to find out whether you did have anything to do with it. And you start with, did Robert Sala deserve to be fired? And there's a float chart. If he says yes, oh, okay. How did you express that? Did you express that? Who'd you tell that to? Did you tell it to anyone? If he says no, then you have an even better story. Did they give you a heads up? Did they give you input? He gave them $35 million last year. Now, again, those aren't the questions you'd ask in real time, but those, those are the points that create the curiosity that lead to the questions that get framed for Rogers once we start down that leg of the flow chart. But the first question, the question that wasn't asked, did Robert Sala deserve to be fired? And you know, to do that job right, and I, look, the circumstances make it very difficult. You're assigned to a beat. Your job is to cover that beat, get news, break stories. You're competing with other reporters. And if you're the asshole who asks the tough questions all the time, you're not going to get one-on-one interviews. You're not going to get access to things that others might get access to. And what you're definitely not going to get is the phone call from the coach, the GM, the owner, PR, whoever, giving you a scoop. That's how you stand out. Spoon-fed scoops. And it really is odd that we think that the reports that come out are actually the product of journalistic endeavors that somebody's engaged in some high-level cultivation of sources and we're having a secret meeting at the parking garage. It's a quid pro quo. You play nice, we'll spoon-feed you information. Jay Glazer told me years ago, 95% of the reporting in the NFL space is not journalism. The only journalism is finding out the stuff that they don't want us to know. And that's my point here. The Jets don't want us to know. Aaron Rodgers doesn't want us to know whether and to what extent he was involved, what he knew when he knew it, and whether he believes Robert Sala deserved to be fired. And that's the gist of my criticism. And it applies across the board in every market. Was I a little more pointed because the New York media has this reputation for being rough and tumble? Yeah. Because we've seen it from the moment Aaron Rodgers arrived. It was softball after softball during his introductory press conference. And I haven't watched every single one of them, but I can't recall a moment where anybody asked Aaron Rodgers a question that made him bristle. They tiptoe around the delicate genius. You know why? Because they have to. Because they know if they piss off Aaron Rodgers, they got a problem. And if they really piss him off, he might be vindictive. And he might go out of his way to make their jobs even harder. And the Jets are the one that brought this guy to town. And look, I'm not, I'm, I'm not saying anything that we don't know. Read Ian O'Connor's book. Those reporters didn't want to end up on the island with friends and family members and other people who've been excommunicated. By Aaron Rodgers. And they they and they, they don't want to they don't want to be on the wrong end of a sound bite where Rodgers chastises someone for asking a bad question. So I get it. I get it. I don't envy the position. But for my position, when we have an opportunity like this where you have to maybe throw caution to the wind to get to the truth, especially when the guy got on his own even higher horse on Wednesday and said he resents the suggestion he had anything to do with it, well, give us a chance to find out, Mr. I've been immunized. See, that's the other problem. We already know he plays word games. And he just got a pass yesterday. So, and look, you can say, oh, he hates Aaron Rodgers. You can say he hates the Jets. Folks, if I hated the Jets, here's what I would do. I wouldn't say a word. Sorry, London. I'd keep my mouth shut. Keep doing what you're doing. You know, it, it's sad but understandable. That when fans feel like any aspect of their favorite team is under siege, they immediately circle the wagons, even if they should take a step back and say, hey, that that guy has a point. It's not a give and take. It's not a back and forth. It's not an effort to engage in reasonable discourse. It is somebody is firing an arrow at somebody connected to my team. I don't like it. We're going to circle the wagons, even if at the heart of that circle of wagons is an owner who continues to prove that dysfunctional teams do dysfunctional things. But how dare you criticize the owner 
that we have no ability to fire. That's the problem. You can call for Robert Sala. You can call for Joe Douglas. You can call for anyone employed by the Jets to be fired except the owner. You're kind of stuck with him. I understand why fans would be inclined to circle the wagons because what else can they really do other than deprive themselves of the thing they love? That's the only way you're ever going to get an owner to sell a team. If you completely and totally boycott the team to the point where no one goes to the games other than the fans of the visiting team, no one watches on TV other than the fans of the other team, and the numbers are such that the inescapable conclusion is it's just too toxic. we got to sell the team. And that's never going to happen because, again, and I understand this. I'm not trying to argue with anybody about this. I'm just trying to understand this. We're never going to deprive ourselves of the thing we love. And it's just sad that look at the last 25 years. Woody Johnson said, I've been doing this 25 years. And you haven't been doing it very well. You're the link at every step of the chain for 25 years of dysfunction. And what we saw this week was dysfunctional. And I know Jets fans might not want anyone to say it, but I think deep down, you know, when you're laying in bed at night or lying, I never know. You, you know, at some level, you got a mess. You, you know, you got a bad owner. All due respect. All due respect to the fortune that someone else made and bequeathed to him. <laughs> I really am trying to get fired. I don't know. I, NFG is one of the, one of the t-shirts I need to make. That was Travis Kelsey on Monday night. And that's me pretty much all the time now. But I, my duty is to the audience. And I know there's people out there that appreciate a truthful and candid analysis of every situation without regard to who it might piss off. In a world that seems to be so devoid of truth, I'm just trying to bring a tiny, tiny little sliver of it. Very tiny. Very little. And to all the Jets beats writer, beat writers out there who are upset with me yesterday, I'm, I'm not going to fight with anybody. People, oh, popcorn emojis. I had one comment because Rich Cimini said something like from the peanut gallery to kind of dismiss what we're saying. We've been doing this. I, I, don't, I don't want to start comparing credentials and audience sizes and statistics and how many you know, people in the league, owners, coaches, GMs, players, agents, media, read everything we write and react to a lot of the stuff we write. It's not really a peanut gallery. It's more like a bully pulpit. And I try to use it responsibly. I know that word sounds irresponsible, but that's, look it up. I did to make sure that, that that's the right term to use. We, we've created the de facto wire service for the NFL. We sift through a lot of different stuff and come up with what we think should be presented to the audience as to everything that's happening in the NFL. We do some aggregation. We do some reporting. We do some interviews. We do some analysis. But we always try to do it in a fresh and engaging and honest way. I think that's one of the reasons why we've grown and grown and still keep growing. We do it with transparency and honesty and candor, and we try to make it entertaining. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Hopefully you've been entertained by this longer than I intended to speak edition of PFTPM. I'm going to go eat breakfast now because I'm hungry. If you're hungry for more football content, see what I did there? Go to profootballtalk.com. We're always open 24 hours a day, seven days a week until they pull the plug or the missiles are in the air. But even while the missiles are in the air, I'll still try to get one last post or two up. On that happy note, enjoy your weekend and we'll see you on Monday. Hi, it's Mike Florio. Thanks for watching PFT on YouTube. Hit subscribe for the latest news and analysis from Pro Football Talk.